Okay. Well, I am really happy to be back and to uh, do this fourth uh, piece in the series. And one of the reasons I'm pretty interested in the topic today is that I am a frequent board member. In fact, I can't think of a time in the last, I think, 40 years that I haven't been on at least one board. And of course, since I have all this financial management training, where do I always end up? I end up on the finance committee. And so I have a big stake in this topic. And I mentioned that because I also, you know, like anybody who has been in a role many times, I have biases. And so I just invite you to chat in if you really disagree with me, because there are diff different ways of looking at this topic than mine. And I'm always interested in what others are thinking. It's really helped me on this series if we do just a quick poll so I know the mix in the audience. So it looks like, oh, we really got the CFO as well. Now it's switching around. It's still moving, which is good. Uh, thank you for answering. And I'm really glad we have at least one board member here because in many ways, that's the, the target here um, to reach some board members and have a, have a sense of what they are thinking. Um, and I think it's, it's really helpful to the fiscal directors and the executive directors to hear a little bit from the board members. So I, I hope we're gonna join our one board member with some others and they can chat in. Um, so if you chose other, uh, if you would chat into the chat box, what, what is your other role? And that, that will just also help me uh, to know a little bit more about who's here. And I think we may have gotten all we're going to get on this poll. So uh, we, can, um, we can go on. We've got an operations coordinator and a grants manager and a bookkeeper. Yeah, we've just got a variety of people in different positions. That, that's very helpful. Thank you. So I'm now going to keep moving, and um, this is what I'm planning to talk about today, but there's enough time for questions, and I, I just encourage you, if you uh, are thinking about a different way to approach this, I'm interested in seeing that, so feel free to chat that in, or if you just don't quite get what I'm saying, chat that in. So what are we going to talk about? Well, uh, we're going to be talking about board roles and concerns specifically in relation to the financial oversight and sustainability of the organization. And can't talk about that if we don't talk about the highest level financial goals. Um, and then we're gonna spend a little bit of time trying to differentiate the role of board as opposed to management. And I'm using that term management to mean um, the executive director or some groups have a management team that top group that the board has selected and the board holds accountable. So that's what I'm talking about when I say management. And we're gonna look at the differentiation of those roles through several pieces of the financial management cycle. And I'm gonna be talking a little bit about uh, how this really is a cycle that repeats in organizations and how the board and management have quite distinct roles. And finally, you know, kind of the whole goal of this session is to talk about strategies to strengthen board oversight and direction setting. Um, so I hope this is going to be helpful uh, for those of you who are trying to support your board to be more effective and for board members themselves. So this is my slant on overall board roles that um, when I think about what, when I sort of rise up out of the details of I do this and I do that as a board member, the overall role we as a whole group have is, is we're the final governing authority. So we get to set the missions, the mission and the priorities for the organization. Now in sexual assault and domestic violence, we boards generally would never do that alone. They work in partnership with the staff and the volunteers and the community on this question of mission and priorities, but ultimate authority to set it is the boards. The board has very distinct oversight roles that are spelled out in state law and also in IRS requirements. So we have a number of things that we are required to do that all are 
aimed at the same goal, which is making sure that the organization operates lawfully and that it uses its resources to achieve its mission, not for any other purpose. So we'll talk more about that. Well, those top two bullets, that's kind of the legal framework for a board role. But I think most of us have realized we're not gonna have a successful organization if we don't get the board to take on two other key roles. One of them is connecting us with the community, meaning bringing in the views of survivors and victims and partner agencies in the community, bringing in those views from our personal viewpoint and also taking out to the community information about what the organization is doing and building its visibility and credibility by speaking up for it. So we have to have that. And of course, we have to have the board willing to take on the responsibility to make sure that we have the resources we need to do the job we've committed to doing. And I know in sexual assault and sometimes in domestic violence, there's a lot of government money. And you might say, well, our board really doesn't have much to do with that other than sometimes we ask them to do some lobbying. I would say uh, that's true, but I don't know very many sexual assault or domestic violence organizations that don't need to get community financial support. It's pretty much a given that just getting restricted funds from the government or even restricted funds from foundations isn't going to do all we need to do. And we're gonna to have to ask the board to help us get those other resources that we need. So when I'm orienting a new board member and they wanna know, well, what are, what are the essential responsibilities of the board? I usually say, well, I put at the top of my list selecting and evaluating the executive director, because if the organization doesn't have an effective executive director, the chances that it's really gonna carry out our mission and priorities and be a sustainable organization are not good. So this is a key board role. I do believe in board setting priorities, I, again, collaboratively. I think it's very important for the board to, if they didn't wanna drag through the details of writing the strategic plan, they have to discuss it and approve it so that it is what they believe the organization should do. And they have to find ways to ensure sound management. So as a board member, my big concerns, besides that, this goes, you know, obviously I am concerned about the quality of our services and our inclusiveness and a number of other things, but my top concern, I wanna be sure the organization is financially healthy and sustainable. I wanna know that we are making decisions that will move us forward towards our strategic goals. And those goals include a lot of program goals, but hopefully they also include financial goals. And finally, we are kind of the ultimate deciders about risk management. And we talked in the last session about risk assessment and risk mitigation, but ultimately the board has to decide how much risk can our organization tolerate and have we developed effective techniques to manage risk. So key concerns, and then coming to the heart of the matter for today's session, when I think about financial goals for the nonprofits that I've served on the board for, I would put at the top of the list, the only reason I'm serving is I want to achieve the mission of the organization. That's the only reason I've joined the board is I want to see the organization achieve its mission. So that's my top financial goal. And you might say, but wait, is that a financial goal? And I would say, absolutely. If we don't get the resources we need and if we don't use them effectively, we're not going to achieve the mission. I also, just because I know we're working to end sexual assault and domestic violence, but honestly, I think we're gonna to need to be around for a very long time. And so sustainability is a very big goal in my mind, as is resiliency, which basically means the ability to withstand adversity, um, to you know, take it and come back and stay strong. And finally, in, it's reality that in organizations that get a lot of governmental funding and some restricted foundation funding, we have got to ensure compliance because non-compliance will be destructive to our financial health and our ability to achieve the mission. 
And there's, you know, my definition definition of resiliency. And I, I just think that's a key goal. Okay, so what do I think are the major indicators of financial health since I'm so committed to seeing the organization be financially healthy? Well, this is my list, okay? I wanna see a positive net income. I want revenues to exceed expenses. I want our net assets, that's the equity. It's the difference between our assets and liabilities. I want to see that it's growing because that's what's gonna give us the capacity to withstand adversity. I wanna be sure we have cash when we need it so I don't have staff just pulling their hair out trying to figure out how to meet payroll because that is gonna be incredibly destructive to being able to get the mission fulfilled. And I want to be sure that we have been able to achieve and document the fact that we are complying with just a raft of regulation. So those are the indicators I'm gonna look for. And um, I then I start thinking about, well, what is the board's job? If that's what we're trying to do, those are our financial um, kind of important high level goals. What's the board's job in oversight? And now I'm dropping down a level from sort of the purpose of the oversight to what are some of the key steps that boards have to take to do effective oversight. Well, they do have to approve the annual budget and it has to be for everything in the organization, all sources of funds, all uses of funds. They need to approve major asset purchases. We're gonna buy a new building, better have board discussion and approval of that. We're gonna take on debt. We're gonna get a line of credit. We're gonna apply for a PPP loan. Board needs to approve that decision board members need to be able to monitor the financial condition of the organization. We need to understand how strong we are. Are we getting stronger or are we getting weaker? We need to have tools to make sure there is sound management. And we'll talk more about that. And since virtually all of us are gonna have an independent auditor, a key board oversight responsibility is to actually select the independent auditor. Uh, because that auditor is working for us as a board. They are going to be able to tell us whether the financial information that we're being given presents a clear picture, a reliable picture, a fair picture of what's happened. So we need to pick them and we need to communicate with them. Now, boards cannot do all the financial oversight that needs to be done in a sexual assault or domestic violence program. It's not possible. So we've got to rely on the executive director taking on high level financial oversight responsibility, including responsibility for being sure that there are timely and useful financial reports. And the executive director is probably not gonna be preparing these reports, at least I hope they're not, but making sure that we get them is their responsibility. I have to be able to count on the executive director or the top management team to understand the financial condition of the organization so that they can make strat recommend strategies to the board. They have so much more information than we do as board members. We really need them to make recommendations. On the other hand, sometimes the board does give a clear direction. I'm on a board right now, and one of the issues we have been dealing with is an inadequate financial reporting system. We just can't get the information out quickly enough, and we can't really count on it. And so we've given a board direction to the executive director that we need to see improvements in the financial system and that we are prepared to adjust the budget to pay for it. So, But we're counting on them to carry out that direction. And key way they're gonna carry it out is they're making the selection of the fiscal manager or accounting service provider or the chief financial officer. They've, they've gotta do that. Um, and they've got more responsibilities. Well, if you're an executive director, you know you have endless responsibilities, um, but I do expect that when they see the financial report and there are unexpected results, costs that seem kind of high and not what we thought, 
shortfalls in income categories that they're going to investigate. And after they investigate, they're going to actually recommend to the board what we're going to do to resolve problems. And sometimes they're going to say, well, it looks bad right now, but it's not really a problem. It's going to be fine by the end of the year. And that's that's a form of recommendation, too. So as a starting point for thinking about this topic, I find it really helpful to engage my board to do a little test of how ready they are to do effective oversight. And um, this is kind of a pencil and paper test. And so I'm gonna invoke my marker and I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna have to remember how to change the color because it wants to be yellow, which no one can see. Okay, so I'm going to suggest that when we talk about this with the board, we set aside a little bit of time. I don't recommend necessarily, oh, let's have a financial management training. No one will come. Um, we just want to do this as part of a board meeting to say, let's see how ready we are as a whole board to do effective oversight. And the first task, I'm going to ask my board members to draw a circle, hopefully better than that one. And I'm gonna ask them to carve that circle up to show the major components of our revenue. Where do we get the money we use? And I don't mean that they should know, well, there's grant 1063 and we get $3,000 from that and grant 5079. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about big pieces of the pie. I'm talking about to what extent are we counting on government money? Are we counting on individual contributions? Are we counting on fees that maybe we've been allowed to charge? What are the major pieces of our revenue pie? And the reason for doing this exercise is we're gonna compare our pictures. And a big question of readiness is you can't really do effective financial oversight and direction setting if you don't understand where the money comes from. So it's a great chance to um, make sure everybody understands that. And then I'm gonna ask them to draw another circle and that's gonna be the expense circle. And I'm gonna ask them to carve up that pie too. And in most of our organizations, personnel costs are gonna be overwhelmingly the largest costs that we confront. And maybe facilities is next, maybe there's another major category, but you know, if people are gonna talk about budget and they're gonna talk about financial statements, if they don't understand where the money really goes, they're likely to spend a lot of time talking about things that aren't really that significant. So this is a great chance to see whether we're all on the same page in terms of how we use money. And the final thing I'm gonna ask him to do, I'm gonna ask him to do some line graphs, right? You know, how we, we all see, we're all watching these for the virus, right? What kind of line graphs am I interested in? Well, I've got four financial indicators and I'm gonna ask them what they understand to be the case about the trend that we've had over the last three to five years. Have our net assets been increasing or decreasing? Has our cash had uh, peaks and big valleys? Um, and when do those occur? So I'm asking them for not the details. They don't know the, you know, who would wanna clutter up their mind with the details? It's the direction that I want them to understand. And I wanna see how well they understand. And I just have been working with a group actually this morning before we started on their annual budget. And it was really important that every member of this group could know with confidence, hey, you know what's been happening on our budget? It's been pretty much like that over the last five years. And in another organization, they might say, no, we hit some real downward trends and we're just barely coming back. So every board member should have that picture in their mind before they attempt to do direction setting or read the financial statements even. If you don't understand the trends, you aren't really gonna understand the statements. So another piece of readiness for oversight is just a question, and you can do this on Zoom, and that is just ask people, what do you think our organization's greatest control risks are? Now, if you're unclear of that concept, um, Michelle's gonna post the slides from last week, and we talked a lot about control risk, but this is really, uh, where are we exposed 
to the possibility of fraud or misuse of funds, misstatement? Where is our exposure? Um, next question I'm going to ask the group is, um, have we had any audit or monitoring findings? When we have the independent audit done, did the auditor have findings about things that we needed to improve? We have all these monitors from funding sources that come visit us. Have they written up any findings about things we need to improve? So that's the first part of the question. And the more important question is, have we resolved them? Have we gotten them satisfied that we fixed it? Board members should know that because they should understand the extent to which we are actually achieving compliance. And I think most every board member understands that yes, it is a key board responsibility to evaluate the executive director or CEO. The question is, why is that an essential control? How is that a control? And these are just discussion questions that I think will give you a sense of how ready the board is to do oversight and whether there might be some sort of basic training needs that be, need to be addressed first. Now, I mentioned that I believe there really is a cycle that repeats in all of our organizations. And actually, when I was an executive director, first time, didn't know what I was doing, I found it, it just this whole business of financial management, it just seemed like whack-a-mole. I would, I would just get a budget done for some funding source and then suddenly somebody would be asking me about my controls and then somebody would say, well, I need a report on that. And then some, somebody would say, well, we need an audit. And I just felt like I never could get a handle on what was really going on in the big picture. And then finally I got it that we had a cycle that we were pursuing and that our cycle involved um, starting with a plan, both the strategic plan, which is usually multiple years and the annual budget plan. And then after we make the plan, we gotta execute it. We gotta do what we said we would do. And we have to maintain records of what we did. And then we have to produce reports about what happened. And then finally, most importantly, somebody's gotta read the reports and decide what to do about them. So I finally got the cycle and having done that, I got interested in, okay, oh, okay. I see a question, that's for Michelle. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna worry about the question. Um, I got interested in the question, well, okay, I understand we have to do a plan, but what part of that is something the board needs to do and what part is really something the staff and management need to do? And so when I think about this from um, a board perspective, I would say the board has got to approve a strategic plan and it needs to clarify um, the goals and strategies, the high level goals and strategies we're gonna use to ensure sustainability. And that plan is probably gonna have stuff about our programmatic goals. It's gonna have stuff about our financial goals. How are we gonna get the money? How are we gonna shift that? And it's probably gonna have stuff about our capacity building goals. Like one of the boards I'm on right now, we have a goal to improve compensation of our staff. And we have actually a sense of targets. And so having put that into our strategic plan, one of the things we do every year when we're being asked to adopt the organization-wide budget is we take a look at whether that budget is gonna get us closer to our target for improving staff compensation. We also have a goal that has to do with increasing the percentage of our income that comes from individual contributions. And same question when I look at the annual budget, is this budget investing in what we need to invest in to move forward on that goal of improving our support from individuals? So, you know, there are some specific challenges in budgeting in sexual assault and domestic violence. And these are just a few, I know you're dealing with many more, um, but one of the big challenges in terms of getting the information organized in a way that board members can understand it is that you got multiple programs and you've got multiple funding sources. Um, so when you're building the budget as a staff person, it's complex. We got a lot of restrictions. And so it's not like every dollar we get can be used for just any expense that we might think is a good idea. So we've got to incorporate those restrictions. 
most of us have a limited availability of unrestricted funds, dollars that the board gets to direct however it wants to direct them. And it's sometimes hard to get a really good alignment of our priorities that we expressed in our strategic plan and the funding restrictions. And I think for some of us, that's been getting a little bit better, but that's still a challenge. Um, Another set of challenges that I really worry about is that, you know, a lot of us have worked very hard to get our board to reflect the diversity of the community, to really make sure that we have voices that can can help us hear uh, issues that have been ignored or downplayed. Um, so we've, we've really worked to get that mix on the board. But part of what is true about any mix of people is that regardless where they came from, all of us have different levels of comfort with financial information. And so if we're going to say the board has a role in setting financial priorities and approving an annual budget, we ought to be sure that everybody on the board is getting financial information in a way that it makes sense to them. And that is not an easy thing to do. So, you know, we're going to look at some strategies, but the big test is, can, can everyone engage with this information or do we just hear the same voices again and again when it comes to financial? direction setting. Another thing that I think is a big challenge is, is the confusion of roles between board and management. And this happens often when you have newer board members who have come from board service in a smaller organization or a different kind of organization. And they are used to the board really doing some of the nitty gritty numbers production or checking the math or stuff like that. And you know, for most of us, that's not gonna work. Management has to be capable of putting the document together, making sure that math works, and the board needs to step up and focus on these questions of, is this budget taking us forward towards our goals that we identified in the strategic plan? So I find the most common problem with boards, other than the, the number of people tune out on the discussion altogether, is those that tune in are overly attentive to details, fretting about, well, why did you raise the supply budget item by 10% this year? Are we buying more stuff? Uh, maybe you're just sitting at home on the internet and buying on the web. If you're having that kind of discussion, that is over attention to detail and confusion of management role and board role. Unfortunately, that leaves under attention to the question of sustainability and to our needs for capacity building. Um, so it's, it's a challenge to get the board to focus on a higher level goal setting and then matching the budget proposal to those goals. So, you know, when I'm um, thinking about a budget that a staff has given to my board, um, this is what I look for. Does this budget provide adequate resources for the priority services that we identified in our strategic plan? And I do understand that you can't spend every dollar on every type of expense, but I want to see that there's at least as much as possible an attention to the priorities that we set. Does it provide adequate resources to recruit and retain skilled staff? That's a huge issue in sexual assault and domestic violence. We get people really skilled and then they leave. And so we've got to work on retention. And I know in Washington, they've been working really hard on retention. As a board member, I've got to be confident that this budget is going to ensure compliance. So if they're skimping on accounting and compliance monitoring, that's not an acceptable budget to me. And finally, the budget has got to move us forward towards sustainability. So I go into looking at a budget document, not planning to rerun the numbers and check the math, but look for um, whether we've got the resources directed in the way we need to direct them. Okay, so the other thing is, remember we did that pie chart. I just always want to remember that in almost all domestic violence and sexual assault, organizations, personnel costs are the biggest line item. So if we're going to have a meaningful board discussion about board priorities, it's not going to be about supplies. It's going to be about personnel. And 
Size matters. Um, if we're a smaller organization, the board may be quite involved in looking at the personnel matrix. If we're a huge organization, no, probably the management has sorted that out, but can report to us on the trends that we're going to see in personnel costs. So the board's going to be asked to make a budget decision, right? It's going to be asked to approve an annual budget. And so that's why that readiness for oversight discussion was so important because for board members to make good decisions on um, financial questions, they've got to understand the context. So they need to understand the financial health of the organization. And in a few minutes, we're gonna actually look at some reports that would help board members understand, well, how well are we doing on this overall sustainability question? And the cash question, do we have enough cash when we need it? So they've gotta have that understanding in a context to make a decision. They really need to understand what our situation is. Are we growing or shrinking? And you know, COVID has kind of been weird because at first, I think many of us thought, well, we're going to have contraction, right? Because if we charge fees for our service, we can't deliver a lot of those services. And um, if we do big fundraising events, we're going to have to move them onto Zoom. So we had a lot of thought about contraction. But for many of us, that's just not been the truth. It's been a period of rapid growth. And that's because of the addition of governmental resources. All of these various rescue plans have added to our budget. So in this odd COVID period, we've been going through growth. But what we want is for the board to really understand the pace, how rapid, how, how not rapid. Another piece of context is board members do need to understand our infrastructure needs. And one of the things that I think has improved over the last five years is that we have more board members who have stepped away from the notion that, oh, we should keep administrative costs as low as possible because if we have high administrative costs, people will think we don't care about our work. So let's just not spend any money on any management or infrastructure and use those old computers and just, you know, tough it out. I think we've grown past that, but some boards are still kind of stuck there. And so part of what the, they need as context is why does it matter whether we're investing enough in infrastructure? Um, they certainly have to understand where the money comes from and where the major uses are. So we, we've done that preparation, that big picture preparation. And remember those trends that we were going to have them graph out? We, we want that to be obvious to board members. And some of us are actually going to um, not just count on them making their own uh, line graphs, we'll make the line graphs for them. And so they can see how these trends are going. Okay, so now, um, of course, as a board member, I am really depending on management to give me these projections. As a board member, I don't have the information that I need to understand how the different pieces of our funding environment are moving over the next year and the next two or three years. Management is staying on top of that and they just need to brief me as a board member on what do we think is gonna happen. Same thing on a lot of the in-depth organizational capacity requirements. Board members don't know what additional staffing you need in a particular program or in the development department, we depend on management to identify those needs. And the final thing I put on this slide was financial models, because often we are talking at, in a budget discussion about making an investment in ourselves. Like one of the boards I'm on a couple of years ago, we decided that we had to increase individual giving to the organization. And so we got help, we had consultants work with us. We identified a strategy to increase our investment in fundraising. But what we wanted to see on the board level were financial models that would tell us if we invest another $60,000 in fundraising, what is the return we're going to get? Now, we know we're not going to get $60,000 more in contributed income in the first year we make that investment. We need to 
to spell it out over time so that we can see how we think this investment is going to work. And then we can compare if we actually go ahead with it and see, well, were we right or were we wrong? So we count on the board to give us that kind of financial modeling. And, and those of you who do charge fees for service, that's where we really need financial modeling to, because we're gonna to have to make investments to be able to bill insurance and other, other ways that we're gonna get fees for service. So we need to see the financial model, what income is gonna come in, what are we gonna to have to invest to get that income? So what is it that I need to be able to give the board so that they can have a meaningful discussion about the budget besides all that contextual information? Well, I would say one thing is we got to be able to get this budget plan down to a one page summary. Yes, there, of course, there's incredible detail behind that. But you know, it's really been proven that most people cannot absorb financial information if they have to look at multiple pages to get it. We've got to be able to summarize it to a one page picture. I'm going to advocate for using what I call a functional budget format. I'm going to show that in the next slide. But basically, that's letting us see what is the income source and what are the expenses planned to deliver each of our major service components and to pay for our management and to pay for our fundraising. I want to be able to understand the impact of restrictions. Sometimes that's pretty difficult. Um, and I, that's, that's one of the challenges of trying to present this information without just overwhelming the board with details about how different grants and contracts work, which, I mean, you can tell them, but they're not going to retain it. It's not going to be meaningful. And so really a lot of what I wanna highlight on the budget, since I'm counting on the board to help us raise unrestricted money, I really want to highlight what the plan is for obtaining and, and using. Now we often have the plan for obtaining the fund development budget, but I don't have the plan for using. What are we gonna use this unrestricted money for? Okay, I said I was gonna show a functional budget format. What I mean by that is that, you know, like all budgets, I'm going to try and get my different tool here. Like all budgets, we got line item categories. We got personnel, we got professional services, you know, we got a whole bunch of expense categories. And we have a total in all of those. But what it happens in a functional budget is it's kind of like the 990. We're looking at what are we going to invest in management, in fundraising, and in each of our program areas. Now, that is not the same thing as each of our grants. And that's the distinction I want to make. So this was functional because probably if, you, if you're still operating, if you're domestic violence and you're still operating a shelter program, you have multiple funding agreements that are supporting that. Um, if you're in sexual assault and maybe you have a children's program, probably multiple sources going into that program. So this is not the same thing as your funding agreements. This is looking at it from the standpoint of what do we consider to be related into a programmatic category? And often we'll have a manager or a director who's in charge of advocacy or in charge of the children's programming. So we're laying out the functional budget based on function. Now that's a contrast to a budget format that has the same kind of line items, but instead of going by function, it goes by our different grant agreements. And, you know, I have four here, but you might have 60 different grant agreements. And then it has a column for unrestricted. Okay. This is that money that we're going to raise that doesn't come tied to specific requirements or specific programs. Now, there are arguments in favor of both the funding agreement cost center structure and also arguments in favor of the functional cost center. Here's my belief. If your management 
you've got to be able to do this. You've got to be able to lay it all out in how you're gonna be able to use your different awards. But I don't think it's meaningful to board members because of that fact that in most of your programs, you've got multiple awards supporting the same program. So you lay out your 60 grant agreements, that is no board member is gonna really take that in. What a board member can take in because it corresponds to what you talked about in your strategic planning is, what are we gonna invest in managing in fundraising and in each of our major programs. And I know that when I see a budget laid out in this format, behind that budget is something like this. So this is program A and you know, I've got a government grant. If only this, look at this, this must be really old. I have some foundation grants and then I'm using unrestricted funds to fill in the gaps. And this is the total program A budget. So. As a, as a staff member, as a manager, I have this picture, but in terms of asking the board to think about the budget, I'm probably gonna focus on this total for program A, okay? Now that's my style, it might not be yours, and there are a lot of ways to do this. But as a board member, what I'm really interested in is this. I wanna be able to understand what income do we get that is specific to support program C. And usually, you know, we've got grants that are supporting it, um, but sometimes there is fee generation as well as grants that are supporting a particular program, okay? And sometimes there are individual contributors that are supporting a particular program. So what income comes because we're doing this program? What are the direct expenses? Boy, my little arrow does not want to help me at all. Um, Let's, let's see if I can improve it. Did I go any better? No. I'll try one more time and then uh, we'll just say that the laser pointer is what we're gonna do. Sorry to confuse things. Uh, so we were talking about what income comes in for program C. Next thing I wanna be able to see is, um, gee, what are the direct expenses of doing program C? This is not any shared cost. This is just what well, we have these staff positions. We have to buy these supplies. We have to do this travel. And this is accounting jargon. You probably wouldn't use this, but it's gross margin. It's the difference between the income associated with a service and the direct expense. And then we are gonna allocate some expenses, right? We've got shared management. We've probably got a shared facility. We may have shared technology costs. So what's the fair share that program C is gonna have to carry and cover with its directing, its direct income that we got because we did program C. And I get a net income by program. Now, in most budgets I've worked on, some of these net incomes by program are net losses. We can't get enough income directly associated with program C to cover it fully. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use some of our unrestricted income to cover the gap. As a board member, I wanna understand that. I wonder and understand which of these programs maybe generate a surplus, which of them actually require our help with unrestricted money. Um, and then I can really, that, that is meaningful to me uh, because then I can say, well, I really want to help raise money because I want to keep program C going. So um, I think this is a technique to avoid getting lost in detail and stay focused on what's important. How are we going to invest the resources that are under our control? Now, take a deep breath. Uh, because this, I mean, the first response to this is usually like, oh, you've got to be kidding. Uh, <laughs> this is just too much. Um, but I, I do think this can be helpful in some organizations. So let me explain what I've done here. Okay, this is a format to try to communicate the impact of restricted funds. Okay, so it works by putting the unrestricted activity that we're going to have, both income and expense, up at the top, and then coming down here at the bottom and putting the restricted activity, both income and expense. Now, this budget is laid out in the functional format. It's got management, development, and these different programs. 
And what I've done here is I, and this is very abbreviated, you can tell to get it on one page. Um, I've put the direct expenses of all those functions. I've allocated the administrative costs out among those functions. So I've, I know what the total cost of doing each of these functions is. And then I've gone through and I've analyzed all my income categories where it's gonna be unrestricted income that comes in. Um, and, you know, I don't want to get into a bunch of accounting talk, but for reasons that frustrate non-accountants, most of our government money is actually classified as unrestricted. That's just accounting talk, but it is for a specific program. It's not just use it however you want. So I've put that government money where we're supposed to spend it. And if foundations have given for a particular program, I've put that in. I've got all the income I can associate with each of these functions. And down here is a really important line and it says release from restrictions. Okay, and what am I doing here? Well, I'm dealing with the fact that we've had funds given to us in a prior period, usually, that are for a specific purpose. We haven't used them all up yet. We have to use them for the purposes that they were restricted to. And I'm planning to use them this year. And here's what I'm planning to do. I'm going to use some of them in program one and some of them in program two. And I've added that in to the total unrestricted income because, again, a counting weirdness, when you fulfill a restriction, it's considered unrestricted income. So I've given a picture to the board of what is the total income we're going to have available. And we're going to be able to compute a net, the difference between the unrestricted income and the unrestricted expenses. What's the net that we're going to be dealing with? And this is actually what I was illustrating on the other slide, that program three here, their net is negative. So we're going to have to use some of the net from our fundraising, our unrestricted fundraising, to fill in the gaps of pro all three programs in this example. That's why we're doing so much fundraising. OK, that's one part of the picture. What's down here in the bottom section of this uh, format is the donor restricted activity. And I haven't filled in numbers here, but we're going after new grants. We're going after multi-year grants. We're going to bring in some new restricted money. And we're not going to be able to use it all in the budget year. That's how it often goes, particularly foundation grants. We work and work and work, we finally get the grant, but we're going to use it next year. Okay, so we're going to fill that in. And then here's that release from the grant that we already had before. And you'll see that this number just parallels the green line up here because it's the same thing. We're releasing it from restrictions. Here we're showing it being released from restrictions. And when I get this part all filled out, I'm going to know the net restricted income and I can figure out the total net income. Now, probably what the board is going to be most interested in is the net unrestricted income. That's the operating budget. Budget. And there, this is all designed to answer the question, how are we going to pay for the costs that we want to have in the coming year? And I know this is a lot of work to come up with a format like this, but I actually have found it really helpful because otherwise we spend a lot of time with people saying, but, but what about that Gates grant that we got? Don't we still have some of that money left? Aren't we going to use some of that? And then we get into these long winded discussions about, well, you know, this and that and the other thing. It is so much easier if it can be on a piece of paper in front of us. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about that. I think the important thing, sort of summary from the planning section here is you want to get your budget documents into a format that board members can see where they have choices. And usually those choices come in two areas. One is, how are we going to use our unrestricted money? And the other is, what are we going to invest in, in terms of building our organizational capacity? So you may not go for that elaborate one that we just looked at. You might go for a simpler format, but you want to give people the, the information they need and the context they need to make good decisions. Now, the next step in the financial management cycle is execution. And, you know, um, this is primarily stuff that staff is going to carry out. But the role for the board here is that we've got to be sure that we do have a good system of controls 
to prevent fraud, waste, and abuse. That's one of our legal responsibilities that we make sure that's in place. Not that we do it ourselves, but that we make sure that we have it. And you know, what are we worried about? Well, we're trying to protect the assets. And you'll notice I put misstatement and non-compliance on this slide because yes, we do worry about misuse or embezzlement, stealing, but I'm actually more worried in many organizations that our financial information that we're sending off to funders and signing, this is a true statement, it isn't a true statement. So we've misstated or that we actually are out of compliance with our funding requirements. Now, as a board member, am I gonna understand the compliance requirements for our 30 different government agreements? No, I am not. I am gonna rely on a combination of the staff expertise and having an independent audit. That's how I'm gonna handle that responsibility. Now we talked about fraud last time, so I'm not gonna go through a lot of discussion of fraud other than to say board members should be familiar with the COSO framework. Now they don't have to know the name of the framework, but this is what fraud auditors in the accounting profession have figured out in terms of how do you get controls that actually work? There are no perfect controls, let's start there. Um, but how do you, get the most effective controls that are reasonable to invest in. And the one I wanna call attention to is the first bullet, the control environment. And every study on fraud and misstatement and non-compliance that has been done comes to the same conclusion that the most important element of your controls is the control environment. And that's where board members can really have an influence. And it's really about integrity at the top. And so that's why your board is going to sign conflict of interest disclosures and why you're going to be really serious about making sure that people do declare their conflicts of interest. But that's not a very big issue in a lot of our organizations. The bigger issue is the board's attention to executive compensation and performance reviews. This is where we are going to demonstrate integrity at the top by making sure that we do a meaningful performance review of our executive director. Now, one of the ones that sometimes people don't like to see on this slide is the board organizing an independent review of the executive director's expenses. Like you give the executive director a credit card, what shows up on that credit card statement. Now, sometimes this is a board member who will agree that they will review the executive director's ex re expense reimbursement report every month. Sometimes the organization is really too large for a volunteer to do that. And we will actually hire an outside accountant to come in and do that regular review of the executive's expenses. Why is this such an important board contribution to control? Because executive directors are vulnerable to being accused of misuse of funds. We have to protect them. We have to have an independent person that has actually looked at the credit card charges and said, yeah, that was fine. That looks really good. And the other thing we're protecting is the fiscal staff, because it's not going to work to say, well, the fiscal staff review the executive director's expense report. They do review it, and that's important, but they're not the ones that are going to be able to confront the executive director if there is something improper on that report. It sets up an impossible dynamic. So the board has to protect the organization from that problem. Um, and finally, I do encourage boards to really think about the value of investing in a third party whistleblower service. Um, First of all, it's not that expensive. And second of all, it is, you know, these whistleblower reports are the most effective way to uncover fraud or um, improper actions. And, you know, you can structure your whistleblower policy so that uh, employees can report their concerns to a board member. But most of us board members really don't have training on how to take a whistleblower report and how to investigate it without messing up any legal position that we might be in. So I think it's worth it to pay experts to handle this for us.
you, you may say, well, we, we can't do that. We can't afford that. But then I say, well, are you going to get some training for the board member who's supposed to get the whistleblower reports? Other thing I just want to remind people when they're thinking about their board is that um, the risk factors for fraud really do include and feature an inactive or inattentive board. They also feature overstressed management and underinvestment in uh, infrastructure. So what are some of the controls that boards have to, you know, make sure that they participate in? Well, they need to get the monthly financial statements. They need to do the annual review of the CEO. They need to obtain, choose the auditor to get the audit, communicate with the auditor and follow up on audit findings. Okay, we're halfway around the cycle. We're to the record keeping, and that's going to be mostly a management responsibility. I would say the piece that is the board's responsibility is to insist on getting understandable information. And if you can't understand it, it's not good enough. And don't don't buy into, oh, I'm just, I'm so stupid. I just, it's just so complicated. I can't understand it. No, if you can't understand it, you need to get it improved. And you may need to be willing to approve payment for some professional advice to get the system designed so that it produces useful information. And the other thing is, you know, you're going to pay for an audit. You're going to have all these funding source monitors coming through your organization. You got to be certain that there's follow-up on those findings. Now we're moving fast, right? Um, because we've made it all the way around to reporting. And remember, I just said, if you're a board member and the financial reports you're getting, you can't understand what they're saying, that's not good enough. You're gonna have to insist on better. So I thought it would be useful to talk a little bit about, well, what kind of information would actually help? And, um, I think it's important to realize that you as a board have different information needs than management has. You have different jobs to do. So your board reports have to be supporting, giving you the information you need for decisions and oversight. Managers need much more detailed, much more granular information because they have to manage specific programs and projects and they have to deal with funding source restrictions frontline. So all that detail that they need is probably just going to be confusing to the board. And one of the saddest things that I've encountered when I go into, um, you know, I'd say mid-size agencies is to see one set of financial reports being run every month that have everything that everybody needs, you know, like just pages and pages. I mean, it's not unusual. I'll see a 20 page report. Well, no board member is going to take meaning from a 20 page report. Managers need that information. So we've got to get the tools that board members need. So when I'm a board member, um, you know, here's my must have. I have to have a balance sheet. I'm gonna talk about what that is in a minute. I have to have a revenue and expense statement that goes by cost centers. Remember we were talking about program one, program two, program three, and has a comparison to our budget. After all, why did we adopt the budget if we don't wanna see whether we're following it? And I also want a year end projection. I'll talk more about that because maybe I don't need that in the first month of the fiscal year, uh, but maybe I do, and I'll talk about why. Okay, well, one of the things that makes this topic so difficult is that in the nonprofit sector, we call the same information by different names. So I think it's helpful to just come over here to the what's in this statement and make sure you've got one. Do you have a report that shows your assets, liabilities, and net assets at the end of the period? So I'm on a board right now. We're just looking at the March financial statements. So we have a balance sheet that shows us the assets, liabilities, and net assets at March 31st, 2021. I need another report that has revenues, expenses, and the net income. And that's going to cover a period of time. So my organization has a July 1 to June 30 fiscal year. So when we're looking at those March statements, we're looking at from July 1, 2020 to March uh, 31st, 2021. 
Now this cash flow statement, that is not the cash flow projection that many of us want and need as a management tool. This is actually a formal gap basis financial statements. Um, a lot of organizations just don't have the wherewithal to produce it every month. Um, if you have bankers on your board, you might want to start producing it because they're going to love this and they're going to stop being upset about accrual accounting where we take into account expenses incurred but not yet paid and income earned but not yet collected. So if you have that problem, you might want to get your statement of cash flows going. Um, so, okay, on the revenue and expense statement, I do need to see this organization wide, total income, total expense, total net income. But I also need to see what's called the statement of functional expenses. And that's where we break it down by cost center. And this one is what's even more helpful because we approved a budget that was a cost center based budget and it had revenues and expenses. So I'd like to see a report that parallels that. But the most important are the balance sheet and the income statement, and you can work towards the others. Okay, so what's on the balance sheet? Well, here's what's on the balance sheet. And this is the area where I find we have some weakness in our sector in that sometimes we just have this reported as one lump sum net assets. But in fact, there are three components to that. And it's worth looking at the components. There's the unrestricted co component. What have we accumulated without any donor restrictions? There's the board designated component. Did our board designate that we set aside certain funds for certain purposes? And there's donor restricted. What are these donor restricted gifts that we've received, but we haven't yet used? They're going to be in the donor restricted net assets. And I just find that I can't get much meaning out of a balance sheet if it doesn't give me two points in time. So for example, my board that I'm working on right now, we just looked at March 31 financial statements. We've chosen to compare that to the end of our last fiscal year, June 30th, 2020. That's one type of comparison. I actually prefer a different comparison, which is to the end of the last month, but I got overruled. So you, you go with what board members want. Here's a sample balance sheet or statement of financial position. I put the arrow down here because this is where I see the weakness often that we're not breaking down the unrestricted net assets and separating them from the donor restricted net assets. It makes a big difference whether the board is free to direct these resources or whether we have committed to donors and grantors that we will follow their restrictions. So this is just a blow up of what we did in the unrestricted. And if you own a building or properties, I would encourage you to break out the portion of your unrestricted net assets that are invested in the fixed assets, the capital items. Otherwise, people can not grasp that a big part of the unrestricted net assets isn't liquid at all. You can't spend it. You got to use it as a, a building to house your programs. Okay. Um, now, we're back to another sample statement of financial position, and this one has the restricted net assets showing. Why am I so obsessed with these net assets? I mean, I've been talking about them since the beginning of this webinar. And the answer is, this is really what gives us the resiliency, the ability to keep going despite experiencing losses. So maybe in 2020, or yeah, I think probably would have been 2020, maybe you did experience a loss. Maybe you've been counting on a, a big in-person event and you just couldn't do it. Um, so the question is, how much are you able to withstand that loss? Well, it depends on what your net assets were. And the other reason I'm so interested in net assets is I am really interested in strengthening the organizations that I serve on the board for. And that means that sometimes we have to take risks and innovate. 
And if I can't understand where we are with net assets, I can't understand what our capacity is to take some risks and try something new. So this is just like the basics. And I often show these charts to board members because a lot of people don't know this and they're embarrassed to ask about it at a board meeting. And, uh, and really it's kind of critical to understand this, that net assets, that's the equity that we have. That's that ability to withstand adversity. And it really is the difference between our assets. Like that's like all our cash and all the buildings we own and all the investments we have and our liabilities. That's the debt that we owe to other people. The difference is the net assets. And as we saw in the other slide, they could be unrestricted, meaning board can decide to do whatever they want to do with them, or they could be restricted, meaning no, we can't do that because we made a commitment to honor donor restrictions. So a lot of what I'm interested in is, is my organization going to be able to build those net assets, grow them, so that we can have more resilience and we can take some risk. Okay, so then that leads to the question, well, how do you grow those net assets? What do we need to do to grow them? And it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> we have got to have years in which revenues exceed expenses. We want net income, not a net loss. Why do we want that? Because wherever we started from, the opening net assets, plus the net income is going to bring us to the ending net assets. Now, if these purple dots were negative, if they were net losses, the ending net assets would have shrunk. And that's not what we want. But it does happen sometimes. And that's the important thing for board members to understand that if we're already pretty strong, if this opening net asset number is pretty good, we can take some hits, we can take some losses and still be all right. So they have to understand financial health as being more than a one year question. It's the result of a number of things that have happened over time. Okay, so in sexual assault and domestic violence, um, we need unrestricted income in order to build net assets. Almost all governmental funding comes with what's called a use it or lose it provision. In other words, if you don't spend the money in the appropriate categories, you're not entitled to get the money. A lot of our contracts are reimbursement contracts anyway, so you never will have gotten your hands on the money. You will have been sending in monthly invoices saying, hey, we spent another $10,000 and they send it to you. Okay, but even those that have provided the funds a little bit in advance generally have a provision that says, at the end of the year, you're going to account for everything you spent on permissible expenses. And if you didn't spend it, well, maybe we'll let you roll it over into the next year, but there's no guarantee that we're gonna do that. And the agreement actually says you either lose it or, or use it or lose it. Now, if you have that kind of agreement, you're, you're never gonna build unrestricted net assets. The best you could do is break even. And in fact, most of these government agreements say, well, here's how much we're gonna give you. We're gonna give you $300,000 for that service. Now, uh, if it costs you $350,000 to provide that service, well, that's not our problem. That's your problem that you had to find another 50,000. On the other hand, we're giving you 300,000. If you only spend 250,000, well then give it back. So that kind of agreement is never gonna let us build net assets. Um, so, but it's the nature of a lot of our agreements. So we got to find some other sources that don't work like that. And that's why I, I think a lot of organizations get interested in either unrestricted fundraising, getting a base of donors, or sometimes they get interested in whether they could pro provide services for a fee. Now I know in sexual assault, a, a core, core concept is we have to have services be available without charge to victims of sexual assault. So I'm not suggesting anything other than that, but I am seeing programs that have found services that they can charge fees for. And the beauty of charging a fee is you set the fee. 
And if you understand what the cost of delivering that service is, you can set the fee a little bit above that cost. Now you still gotta pay attention to well, what can people afford to pay, right? And what are others charging for similar services? So it's not like just pick a number, any number. And some of us would say, well, I'm, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to recognize that some people that want to purchase this service can't afford the price that I am charging. So I'm going to work on, on essentially scholarship money to make sure that I can help those people and still let them pay something. But I just think if you're, if you're looking at this conundrum and saying, well, yes, we do need unrestricted net income. How are we going to get it? Well, we're going to raise unrestricted contributions. We might be able to do some fee generation. And the other thing we're going to do, some of us are building endowments that will throw off investment income that is not restricted in terms of being able to use it for operations. So you want to have a strategy. And that's something that I think well, I don't think the board is going to be interested in the details of how you work with this grant source and that grant source and how you shift costs among the different grant sources. That's not really board discussion, but board discussion about where are we going to get more unrestricted income and build our unrestricted net assets? Yeah, that's a key board topic. So what do we want on the statement of activities? Well, um, it's for a period of time. I think it should distinguish management, fundraising and program. Uh, why? Because that's how we planned. It needs to distinguish unrestricted and donor restricted. We talked about that. And now I'm adding another element to that. And I'm saying what, as a board member, what I really want is this column. And I definitely want it by the time we're halfway through the year. Because, you know, budgets are predictions. They're our best estimate of what's going to happen. But we're not clairvoyant. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. So it's not surprising that when we look at the year-to-date amounts in various income and expense categories, um, and we think about, well, I'm halfway through the year, so these should be like at 50%, then I'm going to see income and expense categories where we're not at 50%. Things happen that weren't what we thought was going to happen. I'm not very worried about that as a board member, as long as I know my staff has a plan for how we're going to make it through the year. So what I want to see is how do they think it's going to turn out in each of the line items? Now, this chart is just highly summarized but in the income section. I want to I want to see, you know, maybe we did our first big funding appeal um, at the end of the year and we didn't get what we thought we were going to get. We fell short by 25% at the end of the calendar year. Now, if I'm a fiscal year organization, I've got till June 30th to catch up. And what I want to hear from the staff is, are we going to catch up? Are we going to hit our target by the end of our fiscal year? Or is, is that not going to happen? In which case, what are we going to do? And so if you're going to tell me, no, we're going to, we're going to fall short on some key income categories by 25%, I'm going to expect to see that you management have made a plan for how we're going to scale back on expenses, because of course, I'm very interested in what is this net income? What's it going to be? Um, so are we going to talk about this every month? Well, we're certainly going to talk about it at mid-year. I'm definitely going to talk about it at the end of each quarter. It depends on what our financial situation is. One of the boards I've served on, the organization was in a financial crisis that spanned three years. And we were looking at constant shortfalls in income. So we discussed the year-end projection every single month because we were constantly trying to refine strategies to make it work so that we wouldn't go further in the hole and further erode our net assets. Other boards that I've worked with, that is not an issue at all. We are really doing quite well. And um, this projection is just gonna affirm what I'm seeing on the financial statements. Now, people often will say, well, do we really need to do that? Shouldn't you just amend the annual budget? Shouldn't you just revise the annual budget in the middle of the year? And that's how you'd see what the plan is. You could do that. 
I don't like doing it that way because I feel like I want to maintain the ability to compare what actually happened to what we thought was going to happen. Because that's going to be useful to us when we start next year's budgeting to really understand that relationship. So I am a huge fan of the year end projection. And you know, you can start doing this year end projection even in the first quarter. If what happened is that you built the budget for next year you're believing that you were going to receive a new source of funds and it was going to contribute, say, um, you know, maybe going to contribute $200,000 into your organization. And in the first quarter, you learned, no, we didn't get that award. Okay, we might as well revise the year end projections right then, because if we didn't get it, we didn't get it. Um, and so let's just bite the bullet and deal with it. Okay, um, this is uh, an, a statement of activities. Remember, that's one of the names for revenue and expense. It's showing that projected year end. It's also showing dealing with the difference between uh, donor restricted and unrestricted that we talked about in the budgeting. And I guess I should just say that my whole goal is whatever format I used in the budgeting, I want it to mirror the format we're going to use in the financial statement so we can compare what actually happened to what we thought was going to happen. And then this is an example of what I was talking about when I said, ideally, I want to see the income that is supporting my different programs, as well as the expenses, and then how what happens when I allocate out my administrative costs. And I'm, I'm trying to get to this bottom line. I'm trying to understand where are our deficits coming from, and what have we got to try to cover them. Um, Okay, I'm seeing a question. Thank you so much. And Michelle is saying, can we talk about finance committee and treasurer responsibilities? Do you think finance committee of a board is more or less useful? I think in most boards, you need a good finance committee because sorting through some of these um, decisions about planning and about evaluating the um, financial outcomes, the financial condition. It's really helpful to have more than one person participating in that discussion. Now, I'm a treasurer of a board and I do have some additional responsibilities as treasurer that go beyond the responsibilities of the members of the financial committee. And I think that is typical. And so in most boards, the treasurer is going to chair the finance committee and actually lead the discussion um, of these financial choices and challenges. And probably as treasurer, I do work much more closely with the executive director and I actually work with the fiscal director on making sure that the financial information is gonna be understandable for the finance committee and for the full board. Now, what I have experienced is that sometimes there's not very many members of the board and maybe not very many of them are really willing to dig in on a high level to the financial issues. <coughs> And in that case, I think it's fine to add non-board members to the finance committee. Like on my current finance committee, we've added a, a guy who is a CFO for another nonprofit organization. He didn't want to be a board member, but he certainly is knowledgeable. We also added a CPA who has a huge nonprofit practice. He's not our CPA. He doesn't do our audit, but he brings tremendous knowledge of accounting to the discussion. So those two non-board members work with the four of us who are board members, and we have really lively discussions as a committee. And then I report out on the high level recommendations from the finance committee to the board. I do that as treasurer. Um, and so I think that system works well for an organization that um, has a pretty well-developed board and pretty well-developed systems. I've also been involved with organizations that are much smaller and they're uh, often 
were struggling to get a finance committee. And so getting a good treasurer is a first step. Um, so I think, um, I think the additional responsibilities of the treasurer beyond the just the things I've been talking about for the finance committee um, often have to do with reviewing documents, loan documents and other documents. Again, depends on the size of your organization, how much of that the treasurer is going to do. And, you know, um, controls, going back to controls, one of the things that I used to recommend as a consultant and now as a treasurer, I sort of think, oh, how could I have said that? Um, I used to recommend that um, the treasurer would review the bank reconciliations every month. And that would be a good idea, but honestly, I think very few treasurers have the time to do it. They might spot check them. So if, if you're a small organization, definitely, Definitely, if you have very little staff and you've got one person doing pretty much all the financial functions, you do want to ask your treasurer to review the monthly bank statement and look at the reconciliation your staff has prepared and have read-only access to your banking account so that you can check it. So you do want to do that. In a large organization where there's maybe six bank accounts and a huge volume of transactions, I think it's worth hiring an outside accountant to do that review of the reconciliation. I think they'll do a better job than a volunteer treasurer will. Okay, we got a question from Margarita. What is the board approving when I say they approve the budget? Well, they're approving the master financial plan for the organization. And I take that approval as focusing on the sort of high level ratios that we talked about at the beginning, the extent to which we're going to rely on grant funding versus uh, unrestricted funding, um, the extent to which we hope to see our fee income increase, um, our plan for our personnel, and particularly the increases in personnel costs. So I'm, take, I'm taking it at that high level. But then the, and I'm assuming that once we have that budget, staff are going to be applying for grants all the time. So I don't expect that we had a perfect prediction. And I, I just, I don't think that's necessary. And I don't even know that I think the finance committee or the board needs to approve every grant application that goes out. I would say, and we're, we're doing this actually on the board I'm on right now, we decided to apply for two new major sources of funding that will require us to start two new program initiatives. Now, we did talk about that in the finance committee because we wanted to be sure that we were going to have the capacity to do those initiatives. In our system, we didn't have to go back to the full board to approve applying for that money, but we did expect staff to bring that decision to our attention. Um, and I think if the finance committee had had grave reservations about either of these, we would have brought it up to the board. Um, but I, I, I don't think you want to hamstring your management from going after funding during the year. And that's where the strategic plan is so helpful, because if what they're going after is consistent with what you said in the strategic plan, then I'm comfortable with that. Now, some people feel they do want board approval of each application. I just I don't think it's too practical sometimes. We've got a question, how in depth does the board need to be in budget adjustments throughout the year? That comes back in my mind to this concept of using the projected year end. I don't really think the board has enough time or information to make the detailed decisions of exactly how we're gonna adjust our expense budget based on some change in a grant. I think the board needs to discuss this projected year end because if it's gonna be materially different than we thought it was, then we do need to talk about, well, why is that? What strategies are management using that maybe aren't consistent with what we want? But I think the details of replanning as you get more information, I think that's a management job and where the interface with the board is, is in this year end projection because if management is taking in all that information about 
well, we heard that we aren't getting quite that much and we realized that we hadn't budgeted enough for this or that. They're taking that all in and they're incorporating it into revisions to their plan where we're gonna see the product of those revisions is in their year end projection. And I'm personally quite comfortable with that. Now, I know that some boards um, have a percentage threshold. If the change that management is going to make to the budget is going to increase expenses by more than 10% or something like that, they do require the board to approve that. So that I think that's something to talk through when you're doing a financial oversight training to have your board decide well, how detailed a, a, a decision making process do you want to engage in during the year or do you want to say we set a plan we agreed on a plan going forward it's management's job to manage that plan and to make it work and it's our job to monitor whether it's working or not and whether it's going to work by the end um, I think that's I think it's more important for board members to stay focused on the big picture than to feel like, oh, you know, they want to add a half a position to this grant. Um, I just I'm not convinced that in now if you're really tiny, if you're an organization that has under 10 staff. Yeah, maybe the board does want to talk about that because, you know, even adding a half time position might make a fairly big increase in your budget. But if you're a large organization with 40 staff or 100 staff, I don't think so. Okay, we need to wrap up here. And, um, you know, there are some tools that can help build board understanding, and we've talked about a lot of them today. And really getting those management recommendations, that is what is so helpful. And it, they can reflect their recommendations in the revised year end projection, but they got to be able to articulate them, <laughs> actually put them in words so we can understand them. Uh, another thing that I personally like, we've talked about projected year end for income and expense. I'm actually really interested in the projected year end for the balance sheet. And some of us say, well, the only part of that we're really doing is we do a cash flow projection that goes all the way out to the end of the fiscal year. So that, that'd be a good start towards that idea. I threw in a couple of dashboards, um, nothing beautiful here. That's kind of another discussion, but it is true that some board members are gonna understand things graphically much better than they are gonna understand them in either words or numbers. Well, the final step in the cycle is monitoring and the board does have a big role in monitoring the financial health of the organization. And um, we, we've really talked about most of this. The only one I don't think we've talked about is recognizing red flags. And, and you know, sometimes when you're management, you are buried so deep in trying to get all the work done that you don't see the red flags like cash going downhill or like um, real shortfalls in different kinds of fundraising. So we do want board members to be alert to that. Um, and, you know, to ask for help when it's needed. So um, I just a few words about the audit, because that's a major type of professional help. Uh, and the board really does need to choose the auditor and then communicate with the auditor and really discuss the audit with the auditor and of course it's recommended now that part of that all board discussion take place with no staff in the room so it's just the board and the auditor talking about what the auditor saw and that's an important control feature and you know i just encourage you get your money's worth from the audit you paid a lot for it if you don't understand what the auditor is saying keep asking until you do understand what they're saying and you know, your organization is visited by funding source monitors constantly. They do write reports. And I have come to want our management to agree that they will alert either the board chair or the treasurer if there is a report with significant findings. Not that we're gonna take over responsibility for addressing those findings, but we should be aware of them. And so this kind of brings us to the end of the slides and the end of the thoughts. And I hope people can stay on for a few minutes for questions. Um, so, you know, what do I think actually helps a board become more effective at financial oversight, um, board training? Uh, 
training for the treasurer and the finance committee, major improvements in the format of our information and using graphics and bullet points. That, that, those are the main strategies. And so I think we're ready to say, uh, you know, okay, so what? What are you going to do? You came to this webinar. What, what steps do you want to take? And my suggestion would be take a look at how clear the roles of board, finance committee, treasurer, and management are. Do that little quiz to assess oversight readiness. Take a look at improving your formats and think about whether you could get the whole board to participate in a financial training. Um, I've done these with boards at regular board meetings where we take maybe 30 minutes and really orient people to the financial health and the financial choices that their organization faces. So I think it's worth thinking about. Okay, and then I know it's 11 o'clock and so we need to stop unless people want to ask questions and is our zoom going to disappear Michelle. No, not at all. I did. I said don't log in <laughs> too early for the next meeting. <laughs> that, was, that, was a, that was a great way though. I thought. Well, okay. Are there other questions or other comments, things that people have been doing that have really helped? I saw this, this note about written summaries and um, the chart or dashboard. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. And I always say, you know, really encourage your board if you're the director to ask you questions because you want to make sure that they do know that they're, that they're, that they feel comfortable to ask us questions because I feel like that's the biggest challenge is not that people don't understand but that they're afraid to <laughs> so say that they don't understand and this is how we learn because there's always like someone else in the room who has that same question right you know I've sat through yeah. a lot of board meetings where it's like that percentage is really weird but nobody is asking about it and probably it's fine but you just need to know what the answer is to that question so that you can be doing your due diligence, your duty of care, duty of obedience, duty of loyalty, right? Right. Well, I, I think I agree with that. And I think that actually doing financial training with board can really help. And, and the way I like to do it is to actually do it with the organization's financial statements and budget format and talk very specifically about where should we look on these reports and when should we ask a question because something looks out of kilter because people don't generally generalize from like a generic training it doesn't work they need to see it applied to their situation um, and I saw a question here about someone who had changed to a financial review rather than an audit. And I think as a small organization, it's probably going to be fine. Um, some organizations go in a cycle, review, audit, review, audit. That's a possibility. What you gave up when you moved to the review from the audit is you gave up the auditor doing um, verification, confirmation of some of your income items. And um, they, because it's a lower level of assurance they're going to provide, they're not going to do as much testing as they did in the audit. But, you know, they are still responsible for letting the board know if the financial statements are way out of kilter and don't reflect what happened. So I, I think that probably could work well. I just think board members need to keep discussing that question. And if they, if they think it would be helpful to occasionally go back to an audit, they could do that. Okay, I think we just, uh, we have a comment here. Board, board should spend more time in unrestricted funds for revenue and expenditures. Well, yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. I mean, they do need to understand whether you are complying with restrictions, but most board members are not going to be able to discern that from financial reports. They're going to get that from the independent auditor and from monitoring reports from funders. But where they really can understand what's happening is, are we raising the unrestricted money that we said we were going to raise? And how are we using it? What are we using it for? And how are we doing it building our unrestricted net assets? So I, I agree that that's, that's the focus. We've got to count on management 
on the being able to manage these restricted dollars, all this government money. And I guess that comes back to the selection and the evaluation of the executive director. If you keep finding that, um, you know, we have problems with our monitors, we have problems in our audit, that's a sign that your management right now isn't up to the job. And as a board, you've got to think about what are we going to do? How can we support our management to build their skills and build their systems? Okay. And did you see any other questions, Michelle, in there that I should try to talk about? Because otherwise, I think we might have done it. Yeah, I did. Okay, well, thank you all for joining us. And um, Michelle's making all the slides available. And I'll just offer again that I, you can contact me through my website. The web address is there on the slide. And I'm happy to answer questions and do follow up. So it's been great to be with you. It's been really fun having people from all over the country. So I think we did it, right? We did, yeah. And so I will take all four recordings. They're gonna be available in our online learning um, kind of section of our website. Um, they're gonna be uploaded with these, with the captions and et cetera. So it should all be um, together um, as a, uh, like, like a package. So you can Great. watch one or you can watch them all. And if anybody's missed any of them, you'll be able to catch up that way. Okay.